Welcome to the Pacific Research Institute's Next Round Podcast. I'm Rowena Ichon, Senior Vice President, and with me is Tim Anaya, Senior Director of Communications. Hi, Ro. Great to be back for another interesting episode. So, Tim, good thing for our listeners that we aren't going to devote an entire podcast to uh, Governor Newsom's speech last week, but as former speechwriters, well, we we can't resist talking about it. And by the way, thank you for the script, the the prepared remarks, because I actually had a hard time watching Newsom's speech live. I'm in LA. The LA broadcast media was gripped with this story of a violent high-speed car chase in the San Gabriel Valley, and it ended in kind of the middle of a freeway somewhere in, in Diamond Bar. But the, the local media actually had a double screen, so they were covering this standoff on the freeway uh, with the police and the driver, and then Governor Newsom's speech. And oftentimes, some television stations would break away from the speech to to give an update of what was happening with the standoff. Even funnier is that some stations even broke away for a commercial break. So that just goes to tell you how, uh, how the, at least the LA broadcast media felt about the, the news value of Newsom's speech. Well, and if LA TV stations aren't covering it live, is that like a real life embodiment of if a tree falls in the forest and no one is around, did it really fall? I thought that that whole issue with the police chase and you could you could even hear the noisy helicopters in the background while he was delivering his speech, because I guess it was not too far from where Dodger Stadium is. It, it would be, as my friend Carol Damon always calls it, advance fail. And yes, the Newsom's team put a lot of, of effort into the symbolism of their surroundings. The empty stadium was supposed to represent the number of Californians who've died from COVID-19. And it was also supposed to showcase in the parking lot, they had one of those big COVID vaccine distribution sites. Well, I think if the intent was to show the imagery of, you know, look at what a great job we're doing on COVID, I think it would have been better actually to deliver the speech from the parking lot where you could actually see behind you all the COVID vaccine distribution going on right there. You know, one of the things from the speechwriter's perspective looking at this is giving a speech to an empty audience, whether it's a stadium or whether you're delivering a televised address, it's a very tricky thing to do. And I think it affected Newsom's delivery because big speeches like a state of the state, they're built upon applause lines and laughter and, and, and audience reaction. When you don't have that, it throws off your timing and, you, and the rhythm of the speaker's delivery. I think it actually would have been better, you know, next to him, there were these big screens showing legislators and others who are watching virtually. Well, you know, if you watch the Ellen DeGeneres show or one of these talk shows, they, actually can have the audience watching at home clapping and you hear them clapping. And I, I think it would have helped him to have that as part of it. And you know, I thought Dan Schnur said it best on Twitter. He said, you don't realize how important it is to have an audience for a speech until they aren't there. He's swallowed up by an empty stadium. And I, I think that was definitely that was definitely true for, for his speech. Well, you know, like you, I thought that the Dodger Stadium backdrop would actually be interesting and potentially effective for showing how many Californians lost their lives to COVID. I think the seat accommodation at Dodger Stadium was about 50,000, which is about the same number of lives that were lost in, in the state. But it seemed to me, looking at that backdrop, it was a very solemn setting. But the problem was that Newsom didn't set a solemn tone for his speech. I mean, there was a lot of happy talk combined with his megawatt smile, a lot of contrived hand gesturing, and he was even chuckling between the lines. So all of this against a backdrop symbolizing the tens of thousands of Californians who lost their lives to coronavirus, it was, to me, it was incongruous, even kind of inappropriate, actually. You know, to use an overused word these days, it, it seemed kind of fake, like he was a Hollywood actor after playing a governor. Well, one thing I just couldn't get over as a Giants fan is I I, I naturally reject anything that goes on at Dodger Stadium. So <laughs> it definitely made for a more painful viewing experience for me having to watch 30 minutes of Dodger Stadium. 
So what did you think of the speech itself? I thought it was probably an okay speech overall. I mean, it was pretty clear that their intention with the speech was to kind of be the kickoff of his campaign to fight the recall. And he had two goals on that front. You know, I think it was it was clear he wanted to show that he was not Andrew Cuomo, uh, that he wanted to tout all the administration's accomplishments on COVID-19 and, and vaccine distribution. That's why you got that kind of laundry list of accomplishments. And that the other thing was that he really was using his speech to kind of unite Democrats or liberals of all stripes around him, because they've obviously calculated that disaffected Democrats are going to be the key to saving his job in the recall. So that's why you heard all the talk of going boldly and we're against partisan power grabs and naysayers and his linking the recall to people with, quote, outdated prejudices. And you saw all of these progressive accomplishments touted. I think one thing that was clear that came across, Newsom was criticized early in COVID for saying early on that he was going to channel his inner Rahm Emanuel and not let this crisis go to waste. And that he's intent on um, turning California into kind of a liberal utopia. And you heard that with his talk of he doesn't want to go back to the way things were once COVID is over and we're going to fight, quote, inequity in the state. If you were a liberal, you were probably cheered by what he had to say. If you were a free marketeer, probably shuddering at the thought of what does he mean by that for the months ahead? Well, as a former speechwriter, I thought the speech was a little too self-congratulatory, especially after the pandemic. So many issues are unresolved in California. Most kids aren't still in school. We still have the highest poverty rate in the country. Businesses are leaving in droves. Obviously, the catastrophe at the California's unemployment office and unemployment is, is still higher in California than the rest of the country. So I would have tried to address that because I think people want to hear about these issues. His speech was mostly all happy talk and how am I going to spread all of these wonderful dollars from the federal government all over the state? Well, Ro, I agree with you on that point on the EDD. You know, like you, I was watching local TV coverage of the speech here in Sacramento and we didn't have the car chase as the top of the news before the governor's speech. We actually had breaking news that there was another computer glitch at the EDD going on that very day, right at the time that um, the governor was about to deliver his speech. So it really was a case of news taking over events. And so I thought it was notable that he didn't address that, that EDD point. He basically ignored the crisis at the EDD in his speech. It's still an ongoing issue for many thousands of Californians. You know, on that point about the happy talk, there was very little mea culpa. There were a few lines about, yes, you know, I made mistakes too, and I own up to them. But, you know, I think it'll be interesting to see how do the voters decide, was he contrite enough about his mistakes to kind of turn the page on this recall? Just uh, another final point, kind of the the big picture look at this speech, the governor made plain and clear that his governing principle, his governing philosophy is about equity. Everything from vaccinations to how the bonanza of dollars, as you put it in your blog, how that will be divided up um, in the state. And it, it it saddens me, you know, as an immigrant, I first came to California in 1965. And Back then, there was so much promise, the idea of moving to the U.S. and equality of opportunity. But now this notion of equity, equalizing outcomes instead of opening opportunity seems the way he wants to uh, govern California. And that's that's very sad and disappointing for me. Bro, I agree with you there. You know, it was um, interesting and really sets up our our. Uh our podcast this week rather well. One of the things visually that was good about the governor's speech that you had this screen and, you know, that you could see visually images of all of the different accomplishments of the governor. And one of the ways where I thought he effectively um, used those images when, when he was talking about homelessness and Project Room Key and the administration's efforts to kind of buy up hotels that certainly aren't in use for tourism these days and to turn them into permanent sites to house the homeless. And 
I thought it was interesting listening to what he had to say about that, contrasting that with what our four authors of our new PRI book that's out this week, No Way Home, what they would think about the governor's anti-homeless efforts and the efforts in general of government at the state and local level uh, to combat the, the massive growth of homelessness that we have seen during the COVID-19 pandemic. No one doubts that you know his intentions are good, but when you're buying up these hotels or paying the rents of these homeless people, you ought to have some kind of accountability that those who are in these hotels are being rehabilitated, that they can get back on their feet, get a job, get therapy for mental illness or end their substance abuse. If that doesn't happen, I got to believe that these hotels are just going to be magnets for homeless coming from everywhere else in the country. And they're going to end up or they're going to devolve into, you know, un unfortunately, unsafe slums. That's exactly right. And that's what you're seeing everywhere around the state. You know, I you notice it so much more visibly, you know, around Sacramento, certainly that I've seen even right by our office. There are always homeless people. Now you're seeing more kind of quasi-permanent encampments that you're seeing along the freeways and even on busy streets in front of shops and and restaurants and such. So I know that our uh, our listeners will enjoy hearing the perspective of our Carrie Jackson and Wayne Weingarten uh, offering their views on some of the ideas that Newsom talked about in his speech and also how uh, market-based solutions can play a bigger role in, and, and nonprofits and community groups certainly um, can play a bigger role in addressing homelessness. Finally, you know, what a difference between two state of the state addresses. Remember last year's speech, which was literally right before our Sacramento conference, our last in-person event in our innocence before COVID, the governor's entire state of the state address was devoted to homelessness. This year, what a backseat it took to COVID and everything else on the governor's agenda. So I hope our listeners enjoy uh, listening to Wayne Weingarten and Carrie Jackson. They're two of the four authors of our book, No Way Home, The Crisis of Homelessness and How to Fix It with Intelligence and Humanity. It discusses all facets of homelessness from unaffordable housing housing, to mental illness, drug abuse, the problems that we have in delivering care to the homeless, the legal issues, how the courts treat vagrancy. We hope you'll buy the book on Amazon. Thanks so much. So as I mentioned, our next panel is going to focus on California's homeless crisis. You know, it's hard to believe that one year ago, PRI held its second annual California Ideas in Action Conference in person here in Sacramento right on the very day of Governor Newsom's 2020 State of the State. And if you recall, Governor Newsom devoted his address that year entirely to homelessness. And unfortunately, despite this attention, California's homeless problem is worse than it was a year ago. Now, most of the proposals put forward by Governor Newsom and other state leaders focus on government programs and increased taxpayer spending, well, as we're seeing on the streets today, you know, these status quo solutions just haven't addressed the problem. Now, PRI has been a leader in California in promoting a different view, a market-based view of how we can help people off the streets and get them into recovery and on the path to prosperity. And we're pleased to announce, Evan, if you could uh, go to the, the screen and show everyone what it'll look like, we're pleased to announce that uh, Encounter Books is going to be publishing a new book on uh, California's homeless crisis in March. And that book is called, drum roll pre please, uh, No Way Home. And it's available for pre-sale right now on Amazon.com or your favorite uh, online uh, booksellers. No Way Home examines the causes of homelessness in California, focusing on unaffordable housing, poverty, mental illness, substance addiction, and legal reform. And our book also examines the state and local policy environment to determine ways in which housing policy, social service programs, and employment opportunities interact. And it explores whether these policies collectively exacerbate, perpetuate, 
or reduce homelessness. You know, there's a lot of discussion about the billions that we spend, state and local government, on anti-homeless programs in our state, um, but very little independent analysis is done evaluating whether these uh, programs are actually effective. So one great contribution from No Way Home is that it evaluates these different strategies that are being used at the city, county, and state levels to prevent or reduce homelessness. And based on their findings, the authors put forward several long-term policy reforms that they believe have the greatest potential to reduce homelessness in California. Thanks, Evan, for that, uh, that slide. You can take that down now. So um, PRI adjunct fellow in California reform, Christopher Rufo was scheduled to join us today, but unfortunately uh, he was called away at the last moment. But we're pleased to have two of the four authors of No Way Home with us today to discuss their new book and research. So Kerry Jackson is a fellow with PRI Center for California Reform. He's an independent journalist who writes weekly op-eds and blog posts on statewide issues. In 2017, he wrote uh, the brief Unaffordable on California's housing crisis, which drew uh, bipartisan praise, including from officials in former Governor Jerry Brown's administration. Uh, in 2018, his brief on poverty in California called Good Intentions drew national attention for his Los Angeles Times op-ed, which was aptly titled, Why is Liberal California the Poverty Capital of America? He's a leading commentator on uh, California's homeless crisis, and we're so pleased to have Kerry with us today. Kerry, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. We've uh, previously heard from uh, PRI's Dr. Wayne Weingarten. As I mentioned, Wayne is a senior fellow in business and economics at PRI. He's also the director of PRI's Center for Medical Economics and Innovation. Uh, in 2019, Carrie and Wayne together wrote a brief on San Francisco's homeless problem, which was presented to Mayor London Breed's administration. Wayne, welcome back. Thank you. Great to still be here. So I thought we'd start maybe with a question that both of you could chime in on. You know, I think what makes No Way Home such a unique book is the diverse perspectives that each of you four authors bring to the project. You know, each of you shares a common free market worldview, but you view the problem of homelessness through very different lenses. And the areas that you focus on are quite different, yet quite complementary when presented together in the book. So a question for, for both of you, how did you view or approach this, uh, this book project? Maybe we could start with Wayne. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think I actually would like to start talking about kind of what unites all of us. I felt like one of the, the common themes we all had was this willingness to actually ask the really tough questions uh, and also to kind of start with the same hypothesis that government policies in some way, shape or form is what's driving kind of where we're at. And I felt like that was a uniting theme throughout the book is that looking towards those policies uh, and willing to ask really, because there are very difficult questions that we're going to need to answer. You know, for me, you know, coming from kind of a, a free market uh, price theory, right, Chicago School uh, of Thinking, Milton Friedman, uh, that was really kind of my driving force, which is, you know, how can we evaluate what's happening here by looking at the prices, or, uh, whether they're actual physical prices, cost of home, cost of uh, living, or just kind of how other policies are working to incentivize or disincentivize actions. And that was kind of my driving force to try to understand this really complex problem. I think, Harry, four, you? Uh, I think four pieces and, and calling each of us a piece, I guess, is what I'm saying, because each of us had you know, multiple chapters. I, I think it all worked well together, even though we did, as, as, as you said, we kind of came at it from different angles. Um, I learned things. If I had sat down to write a book on homelessness in California, and by myself, no way I come up with some of the things that uh, the other three came up with. So I, I learned a lot and everybody added to the book things that the other three couldn't possibly put in there. So I think it worked together well as a, in an entire piece and couldn't have been, there's no way, as again, if I had written a book by myself on this, I think any of us would probably say that for the four, if we had sat down to write it by ourselves, we wouldn't have come up with anything nearly as comprehensive or as thought provoking. 
maybe uh, you could take us, we'll go behind the scenes a little bit. You were also kind of the editor of the project. <laughs> How challenging did you find it weaving together, you know, such different ways of looking at it into one kind of cohesive book? It wasn't as hard as you might think. We had thought, well, maybe do we want to have somebody, and it would, end up, would it be me, to essentially make the voices the same throughout. One, one voice, one style of writing. And this is something Wayne and I thought about and, and talked about. And we decided, let everybody have their own voice. They have their own way of looking at things, their own experiences. So in that sense, uh, nobody's you know, colorful thoughts were taken away from nobody's writing style were, were taken away from them. It, it just, it worked out very well in that sense. It, it turned out to be actually quite easy to do it that way. And I think it worked out better. You know, if, if you read through it, you're going to find it, it you're going to find a, a it's going to feel different from chapter to chapter because of this, but it doesn't in any way interrupt the, uh, the flow at all. And I think when I say, you know, they really all, um, everybody's perspective really complements one another. You know, that I think a lot of what we read uh, about homelessness, it's very kind of black and white, or, you know, this angle is the only way and this should be our only focus. And I think that's what's great about your book is that it really is, um, I think you really get a complete view of the problem and what's working and what isn't and what we should be doing, reading all of your perspectives together. I hope that's the way it turns out. I, uh, I feel the same way. Having read it, I can attest. That's how. Uh, <laughs> how many times did you read it? Uh, I think I read it about a dozen times <laughs> during the uh, during the editing process. But well worth it. It's a it's a terrific book. And again, I'll give another plug. It's available for pre order now at Amazon.com and your favorite online um, online booksellers. Carrie, maybe a a question for you. You know, I think uh, you know. Obviously, it's no. Uh, it's no secret that I'm a big fan of your work and your writing. And I think what you do so well is, you know, using beautiful and powerful language to really paint a picture and set the stage of the problem for the issue. And I thought you really did that exceptionally well in the setup of this book. Um, you know, you titled kind of the opening chapter of the book, postcards from the epicenter. I think you might want to trademark that because that's a good, uh, that's a good line. And you really paint a vivid picture of what people from San Diego to Eureka are, are, are seeing. Maybe, um, you know, you could share a few of those kind of examples that you, that you put forward of what different cities and towns are experiencing in California today. And I guess maybe that leads to, um, you know, maybe this is too audacious a question. You might need another few hours to answer this one, but just how bad is homelessness in California today, you know, based on the examples that you present? Well, first of all, I appreciate the compliments, uh, but I have to come clean. The postcards from the epicenter was not mine. That was, that was not my doing. And if, if I could have it trademarked, I would, but it wouldn't. I would be stealing somebody else's intellectual property rights. But it is interesting that using the word epicenter in, in California, not associated with earthquakes, but uh, California truly is the epicenter of the homeless problem or homelessness. There's more than 150,000 homeless in the state. Uh, yeah, it was, things were flat for a while, uh, but from 2018 to 2019, there was a big jump in the state, 16% of the homeless population. And that, that is a big jump, no matter what kind of population increase you're talking about. Uh, and, and putting together the book, one thing that did strike me, a, a number of things did, but was California's portion of homelessness across the country. We're 12% of the population of the U.S., but 27% of the homeless population is in California. So truly, there's a big problem. And uh, speaking of, of growth and homelessness, uh, over that same time period, 2018, 2019, San Francisco's homeless population jumped 30%. That is a, a monstrous, that is an immense jump. But it's not just the big cities. We think it's the big cities. Of course, we hear about it in, in San Francisco. We hear about it in LA. Not so much in San Diego. It's there, but Sacramento. Uh, we have it uh, in, in Silicon Valley even. Uh, but there, it's a rural problem too. And the problem, and one of the issues there, we don't know how big it is in the rural areas because they don't, the, the homeless in the rural areas don't tend to go to shelters. They're more spread out. They're not in soup kitchens. They're not available to be counted in the same way. But it is a statewide problem, any way you look at it. 
And uh, it's unfortunate that then since we started working on this really about two years ago, it doesn't seem to be, I can't think there have been no policies or cultural changes that have made improvements in the situation. You know, it's interesting. If, if I can jump in, Tim, I apologize. Yeah, one, one thing is, is really important when you talk about all these spikes in California's homelessness is that outside of Seattle or New York City, you're not seeing, not only you're not seeing an increase of similar magnitude elsewhere in the country, it's actually going down. So like if you go back to 2007, back to the, the, the end of the, or the beginning of the, the last big recession, homelessness had been falling both in California and in the rest of the country. And then all of a sudden here in California around 2014, it starts spiking back up and it, it's now exceeding previous levels. But not only is it really bad here, but it's, it's a stark difference from what's happening everywhere else in the country. Do you have any thoughts about what might explain that? Oh, <laughs> lots of thoughts, Gary. <laughs> I'll, I'll just jump in and, and I don't want to, to ruin anything I was planning on saying later, but I, there are some perverse incentives in California that I think that, that draw people, the homelessness, or the homeless, I'm sorry, into the state. Uh, there's a figure, and I will ruin this, and I'll use it again just because I, I think it's too good not to use, but uh, San Francisco gets about 450 people, homeless people a year from other places. So they're not all homegrown. And I'll, I'll, I want to double check that, that number again. But, you know, we're talking, that's, a, that's 450 new homeless people coming from other cities or states to a city. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty good size. Uh, there's an effect there. And, uh, you know, I, I think the homelessness population in San Francisco is closer to 10,000. The official numbers are lower, but... If you talk to people who are in, who are dealing with them on a regular basis, uh, the ambulance drivers, the paramedics, the emergency room people, the, the officers, they're going to tell you, and, and it's for the shelters too, they're going to tell you it's more like about 10,000 people. So, you know, think of that, that portion of people coming in on an annual basis. Hey, I think uh, to, to, to answer the question also, oh, if, if I can do an analogy, when you talk about like, why was the Great Depression great? <clears throat> it's because it's a comedy of errors, right? It's a confluence of a lot of bad policies all coming at once. And uh, one of the things I loved about working with the guys with this book, you know, I come from the, the economic side and there are a lot of economic errors that they made. But at the same time, what we're doing these economic errors, making the state unaffordable, we're also changing kind of how policy litigation, right? In terms of people's rights to be, uh, are you allowed to camp? on public property and how the, that legal change, uh, and this is one of the things we traced out, which I, I thought was fascinating, is that by trying to give these rights to be homelessness, we're actually now not only encouraging homelessness, but making it more difficult for those uh, police officers or others who are trying to help the homeless to actually transition them to uh, some sort of uh, facility that can help them. So we've had both kind of legal policy, economic policy, and social policy all kind of at the same time going in the wrong direction, which kind of, I think, uh, that confluence really has led to this crisis. I'm going to back up a minute because I believe you used the year 2014 when housing prices really took off. I think you had charted this when you, yeah. is that, that's the year you mentioned. That's also yeah. the year, if you, if you look at it, where the population of the homeless in California had been pretty flat from 2004 to about 2013, 14, 15 in there. Then that's where it shot up. So are we talking coincidence or are we talking about their, their cause and effect? I that's, think a good, that's a good segue into my next question for Wayne about this issue of housing policy. Now, there's a real debate amongst experts about the extent that California's broken housing market is contributing to the homeless crisis. Um, you argue in the book that an evaluation of our homeless problems would be really incomplete without considering the negative impact of our unaffordable cost of living that has put housing out of reach for some. In your view, how has the housing crisis pushed many into homeless and has thousands more on the brink of becoming homeless as well? I think that the framing of on the brink is, is so important. Um, I guess think of it this way. If you were anywhere you know, generally in the country and you were going to go apply for a mortgage, uh, the general rule of thumb is about 30%. And is that if the mortgage and including tax, all the other fees are about 30% of your gross income, then that's an acceptable level. 
And if you look at the median income across the country and you look at the median house payment, except for the housing bubble, you generally see that around 30 percent. So, you know, it's kind of sticking to that level. Right now in San Francisco, it's at a ridiculous 80 percent. In other words, the, the mortgage payment on a median priced home in San Francisco is 80 percent of the median income. Uh, in L.A., it's around 40 percent. I mean, in, in lots of other parts of California, it's it's, it's around those levels too. So we're really at kind of ridiculous unaffordability. And so what that leaves people vulnerable to life events, right? If you have one kind of, you lose your job, you have a divorce, you have an adverse health issue. It can, you know, it, it pushes you over to the point where you can, you, you get into that cycle and you can't recover. Uh, and, you know, so, and, and a lot of that is driven by regulations. And one stat that we put in the book, which to me was fascinating, again, kind of looking at these the numbers, in order to construct a median, oh, I'm sorry, an affordable house, a unit uh, in Los Angeles, it's going to cost you about $700,000. It's going to cost you that because you not only have all of the regulatory sequel and all these kind of uh, zoning regulations that you have to normally comply with, but affordable housing throws a few on as well. The median price of a home in LA is 618000 So it costs more to build an affordable home than it does to actually just buy a home. And it, it's all of these types of crazy kind of policies that have pushed prices to the point where people just, they literally cannot afford to be in a home. And we haven't even touched on, by the way, the excessive cost of groceries, all the global climate change policies that make energy the most expensive in the country. So when you kind of put all of these burdens on people, it just, it becomes Im uh, impossible that people aren't going to fall behind. So a question for, for Carrie and Wayne, feel free to, to chime in if you have any thoughts on this. So uh, Chris Rufo has really a different take on the housing aspect of the homeless crisis. You know, he writes about um, a controversial program is called Housing First, um, which um, he writes in the book, the, the city of Los Angeles has made a $1.2 billion bet on the program. And he argues it's going to be uh, a bet that it's not going to do as well as many people's Super Bowl bets this weekend. Um, you know, as we have found in our, uh, here at PRI in our other work, Housing First really complicates the effort to address homelessness, especially programs like St. John's program here in Sacramento. We've had uh, the former executive director, Michelle Steve, has been a guest on our podcast and we've done work with her over the years. And they are a program that requires sobriety and other, um, you know, have certain uh, requirements for participation. And um, you know, they argue those standards are really what's important to their program and make a difference in really turning people's lives around and, and, and get them on the on the path to recovery. So, Kerry, maybe you could um, start out, speak a little bit on, you know, housing first and why this is a, a, a solution that's bound to fail. And Wayne, if you have any comments, feel free to join in as well. I, I think rather than calling housing first, you would probably more accurately call it, call it housing and nothing else or housing and that's all. It, it doesn't address the root problems at all, the causing of homelessness in, in, in people. You, you, Chris Rufo said that it's, a, it's seductive as a policy pursuit, but there's certainly no panacea. Uh, he cited some facts, some data, and who looked at uh, some researchers looked at housing first, and he said more than half who enter the housing are gone within the first year, and about 40% come and go. So it doesn't, it doesn't improve their lives. It doesn't improve the root causes, which are often uh, substance abuse and or mental illness. And, and in fact, it, while it doesn't improve them, and oftentimes it actually makes them worse. You're essentially giving a person a place uh, that doesn't do anything but change their location of where their prob their, the problems are the same. They're, you're just changing their location. Uh, he's, and again, I'm going to use his words. He says that uh, they are housed but still broken. So you know, I, I, I think it's, it's, it looks good maybe to throw out a bunch of money and say we're going to put these people in, in, in housing, but the outcome is not what people think it's going to be. It just it simply, it rarely works according to his research and what we, you know, we, we went through in the book. 
Yeah, I think the, you know, the housing first is great branding, and it's I think it's much better branding than it is actual policy. Because if you're against housing first, it makes it sound as if you're against housing, which is just the exact opposite. What, you know, Chris, he, he did such a wonderful job, kind of going through and documenting the amount of mental illness and drug addiction. Uh, and if if we're, if we're going to sustainably solve the problem, we need we need to deal with those difficult issues of how do we get people help so that they can get free of, of, of the addictions and they can kind of get any type of help that they need. And so uh, we, that, that's one of the flaws of Housing First is that it, it, it's not prioritizing kind of those first principles. Well, I will add that no one I've talked to in putting together this book or any of the op-eds or anything that I've written, going back to the brief with, with, uh, with Wayne and earlier, uh, no person who's on the street, uh, like a Michelle Steve, as, as you mentioned, Tim, who was at St. John's, uh, they're not going to they're going to tell you that it just doesn't work. And they have the experience. They have the history. They, they've seen it played out in front of them on a regular basis. And you also see what I think really great is if you look at a lot of the private organizations that prioritize that holistic approach. You see that, that they, they get a lot of success and they get people where they can actually kind of reengage and get employed and and sustainably stay kind of in 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 a home uh, a reminder to everybody watching on zoom if you have any questions for carrie or wayne make sure to use the zoom q a function that's in the middle of the bottom of your of your screen um, the other co-author of no way home joseph tartakovsky also couldn't be with us today and joseph as we mentioned a little bit earlier he has a very interesting uh, perspective uh, in the book, and that's a legal perspective, discussing the, the key legal cases and, and, and constraints that are really hindering the ability of, of local governments in California and across the country uh, in addressing homelessness. Um, hoping, you know, one or both of you, do you say a little bit about these legal issues and, and Joseph's perspective in the book? Sure. Okay. Uh, do you want to? Uh, well, I, I have some. Uh, I think I'm going to add a little bit later. But I, I, I've heard you talk about this. Even I think it was just <laughs> yesterday, and I thought you did a fine job on it. So I'm not going to. I'm not going to step up. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll, I'll jump. I mean, what what I, what I, I learned a tremendous amount reading his his perspective. What he really does, which is, uh, again brilliant, it goes back really to colonial times and and traces how, from a legal perspective, we uh, as a country have dealt with people who back then it was called vagrants, right? Vagrancy. And at first that, and it used to be the laws were kind of castigation and contempt for kind of people who are homeless. And the, the, the public goal was to kind of show them out of town, right? And that's how homelessness is dealt with is, you know, just, just get them out of town and whatever happens, as long as it's not in our borders, we don't care. Uh, and that's evolved. And now that, uh, the way, uh, uh, Joseph puts it is um, for uh, sympathy and support is the way the laws have been evolving. But part of that kind of evolution has raised other types of issues because there are currently laws in the books uh, that refer to kind of no camping laws. And the idea is you can't just sleep uh, on the streets or you can't sleep in a public park. But that's started evolving. And that's evolved in a way where uh, people now are gaining a right to sleep on the street. And the idea comes from the idea that if I don't have a home and sleeping is part of kind of a natural process, I, you know, as a human being and being alive, I require sleep. If I do not have a home, you cannot outlaw, you know, I have a, I have a right to sleep, so you cannot outlaw kind of sleeping on the street unless there's an adequate amount of shelter beds that's accessible for that person. And that kind of creates this false sense that you can actually move people off of the streets if the beds are available, inevitably the beds aren't available. And certainly a lot of the people who would interact with the homeless policemen, others aren't gonna be aware of where those beds would be. So you've actually are creating this right to be homeless where you can't do anything about it. If somebody's camped on the streets, they have the right to be there. So we've really, the pendulum has really swung from kind of a villainization to kind of where we are now where this is this right to be homeless uh, and we, so we haven't gotten the, uh, the balance right. But the other issue, because so much of this is evolving through the courts, and, th and this is something that we really as a society need to struggle with and come to an answer, this really is a legislative issue because it's policy and it should be something that legislators are dealing with. But instead what is happening is that the courts are developing 
this constitutional right. And certainly once something's a constitutional right, you've completely changed the tenor of it. So we need to actually get that policy right and deal with kind of the litigation sooner rather than later. Otherwise, uh, legislative hands, they're already becoming more and more tied and we need to address that soon. Otherwise, uh, there'd be a fewer options. Yeah, I, I would just want to add one quick thing. And, and uh, later in the book, Joseph, I, I think does a good job of addressing what he calls the unavoidable tension between the rights of a few and unfortunate and the rights of everyone else in the community. And I, he, he, you know, he gets that quite right. And I mean, he's been, you know, he's been close to this issue uh, for quite some time. I mean, he is, you know, he has litigated, uh, I believe it was Boise, uh, the, uh, the case in Boise, Boise. Idaho. Uh, but he, he discusses community courts uh, and it talks about laws that are fair and less subject to legal challenges, but at the same time, uh, legislation that is gentle. And he suggests compassion. Again, his words, I, I like these. He suggests compassion and collaboration over stigma and coercion. Uh, Carrie, you write uh, that many of California's state and local policies are actually incentivizing homelessness in, in their communities. We've touched a little bit on it earlier. So what are some of these policies that encourage homelessness and how do the officials who uh, adopted these policies in the first place justify them? I, I, don't, yeah, I don't see them actually justifying them any way that I would, uh, uh, in, in any way that I would buy as, as a reasonable. Uh, reason behind it, but uh, San Francisco has an example, and I would say it's well earned, or, or reputation rather, uh, of for things refusing to enforce laws, particularly trespassing, aggressive panhandling, using public spaces uh, as an open restroom, uh, blocking sidewalks, things like that. They're simply they they go unpunished. The 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 homeless are able to do these things without any kind of uh, they're they're they have taken over areas. It's, it's quite unfortunate. I think this this is something we've all heard about. Um, and it's been said, and I believe this is Heather McDonald who said this uh, from the Manhattan Institute. Uh, she said that it, it's assault seems to have been normalized in the city because so many people have been attacked by homeless people and nothing has happened. And, and of course, the homeless people are probably mentally ill. They, they're, they're suffering. From, they're addicted. They don't know what they're doing. They're out of their minds. But they, it's, it's allowed to go on. So there, there's some of the incentives are almost like benign neglect as far as you know, we're, we're not going to enforce the laws, uh, quality of life laws. And I, I think that's an incentive of people want to live a certain way. I, I think California in general has made homelessness more comfortable or homelessness is comfortable for a lot of the, uh, of the population. Uh, and I'll get back to that number again. I, this is where I came up. That the 450 new homeless people a year in the city of San Francisco. Well, why do they come there? What makes it special? It's not necessarily the weather. You know, we all know it gets pretty cold in San Francisco, even in the middle of the summer it can sometimes. So it's not like Los Angeles or San Diego. If you're going to be homeless, those will be the places you want to be. So what is drawing them there? Uh, there are benefits, there are services that they get. Um, you know, and and this the, that does nothing to stop them from going down the path they're already on. It, it, it only it enables them. It, it confirms what they're doing in their minds, I suppose. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, we also have people who call themselves homeless advocates, and they often oppose any kind of intervention. The policymakers and policymakers go right along with with this, and uh, you know, it, it's they, they call themselves advocates, but they're you know they're doing a disservice to the people who are really struggling out there on the streets. Wayne, there are a lot of social costs, as you document, that are associated with homelessness in California. And you write about the impact, putting on your economist hat naturally, you write about the impact that homelessness has on the economy. But instead of trying to document an actual dollar cost, you actually document the many ways that homelessness undermines the economic well-being of all Californians. Could you uh, share some of what you found? Sure. Yeah. I, I, the reason I stayed away from a kind of one macro number is I don't think it does justice. You know, four hundred billion. It, it it doesn't. You know, it's it's too dry. Uh, and when you start documenting, you start realizing some some of the things Carrie was just talking about. The health implications. I mean, I think these are things anyone in California has unfortunately 
heard about all too often, but we have diseases, uh, you know, health implications that are tragic for the homeless, but it's also kind of getting out of those communities and impacting broader society. So we have now these health crises that you would think, you know, we wouldn't be dealing with in, in the 21st century typhus, other medieval diseases, but we are. Uh, and, and that's a huge cost, um, not only in terms of kind of the health implications for ourselves, but also there's a, a economic consequence, right? There's conferences, uh, you know, one that we know in the book about uh, a medical conference, $40 million conference that canceled because uh, it was supposed to be in San Francisco. And they said, well, wait a second, you know, I don't know that one, this is the place we want to be. We don't feel safe. We don't feel like this is going to have the the ambiance that our conference deserves. Uh, and, and that, you know, that's one example, but it's happening writ large where you see retailers recognize their, their sales are down, right? Especially, you know, along the pier in, uh, in San Francisco or, you know, uh, in places where homeless in, in LA are, are impacting it. Retailers are losing money and that's an economic consequence. It's hard to quantify that. How do you put that into kind of a macro number, but it's no less real and it's no less a, of a consequence. It's, it's the same thing with driving people from California. You know, I, I remember for, for years, you know, the California was the magnet drawing people in from all over the country, right? And now the talk is, you know, last year, 200,000 people, uh, dom domestic net migration, not including people coming from other countries, 200,000 people left California. I mean, uh, this statistic always wows me. If you're going to rent a U-Haul and you can take that U-Haul from L.A. to Phoenix, I believe it is, it'll cost you $2,000. But if you're going to take that same U-Haul from Phoenix to L.A., it'll cost you $200. Because everyone's fleeing L.A., that U-Haul doesn't have enough trucks there. So, you know, they, they, this is great about the kind of the market economy, but prices have balanced out to try to get more trucks coming in because there's a shortage in L.A. and a surplus uh, in Phoenix. Homelessness and all of the social consequences is part of what's driving that. And again, the problem is when you're losing population, you're losing vibrancy, we're losing kind of the, the, dynamic, the, the dynamic kind of economic growth that all of that would in, entail. And, and we haven't even touched upon the, uh, the implications for taxes and spending, right? We know this year the state alone spent over a billion dollars just on the programs that we can document, right? Because beyond all of the services, the new room key or home key, uh, uh, program and all of the different shelters and other things we run, you also have costs that are hidden, right? Because the police have to spend a lot of resources and time and personnel addressing issues due to the homeless crisis. That's not directly a, a homeless expense, but it is kind of resources that are getting stuck up. You know, we have billions at the local level that are being spent. You know, all of these are opportunity costs that either fewer other services that are actually public goods aren't being provided or what's actually happening is taxes are being raised higher than they should be, which then of course feeds into the other problems, drives people out of the, uh, the state more. And so the, the cycle continues. So we have this, this, this vicious cycle now occurring where people are uh, suffering economic consequences, social consequences, health consequences from the homeless crisis, which then creates more activities, uh, actions that actually just accelerated, and that's the cycle we're in. Well, last question for you both before we get into uh, the audience questions. And, you know, we've talked a lot up till now about the complexity and the severity of our homeless problems in California. But I think what really sets No Way Home apart is that it's also a very solutions-oriented book. And each of the four of you put forward uh, different ideas for state and local communities to consider in their efforts uh, to combat homelessness. Obviously, we don't have time to go through all of them today, but could you give a couple of examples of policy reforms or even successful programs that you believe could be put to good use if adopted or replicated in other communities across the state? I'm going to go first on this because Wayne's probably worn out from his, uh, <laughs> it was his turn last. So in case he's got to dry him out. Uh, one, one thing that I ran into that I, I or we ran into that I, th I thought would be very helpful was reuniting or efforts to reunite homeless, or, I'm sorry, reunite the homeless with their families. 
Um, this is obviously not going to work for everyone, but I know we, we know that Santa Barbara, Santa Monica have had good results. I believe Anaheim has also had good results from this. So I'd like to see this tried on a wider basis. And, and, and let's see what the numbers say when we have a good sample size of this type of program. Uh, I, it's some people just need to be back where they can be, you know, they can have the love of the family. And, you know, I, I think for, I think for a lot of people, that's going to make a big difference. I, I'm going to throw this out as well. And I believe Wayne and I first ran into this on our brief that we did for the homelessness in San Francisco that was presented to Mayor Bree. And in Vienna, Virginia, there's a nonprofit called Shelters to Shutters, and it partners with businesses. And they, this, this, these, this partnership actually puts people to work. It doesn't just put them in housing. It puts them out there. It gives them, that gives them jobs. They have to earn the jobs and have to earn the pay for this. It turns their lives around. And I would like to see these kind of partnerships flourish. Yeah, I, I, I want to emphasize that. I mean, that's such an amazing program, you know, that, that public-private partnership where you're giving the skills necessary. It's, it's, it's almost like the rebuttal, I would say, to, to, to housing first, right? Where you're actually saying, this is kind of life skills first. And, you know, how do we actually sustainably bring somebody back to, so they, they have the, the pride, the ability, the skills to, to, to permanently kind of end the cycle uh, I, I guess I, there's two things I would love to add in, uh, before we end this. One, there, there was a program, the host program uh, in, 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 um, in, in Santa Rosa, where you actually are using the police officers who are often like that first kind of line interacting with, uh, with the homeless who may not be aware, often aren't aware of private uh, shelters or other types of resources that they could help. So trying to use, empower them so they don't feel so helpless and that they're able to, and maybe it's not police officers, maybe it's it's some sort of social work, but have them empowered to be able to get the homeless to a place that uh, can help them. Because there are often outreaches where it could be where everybody wants it, but just nobody's aware of where those resources are. And so we need to kind of better better use the resources that are there to actually get people uh, to organizations or, or places that can help them. And then you know, I, I would be remiss uh, to, to not to mention affordability, uh, since that, that was such a, uh, I, I believe, such an important driver of the homeless crisis. When you look at the spike in homelessness and the spike in the unaffordability in California, they, they, they just they fit like a hand in a glove. And so we, we need to start making California's homes affordable again. And that starts with broad deregulation, with its CEQA, its zoning regulations, getting rid of rent control, coming up with policies. I think, Carrie, you're the one that came up with this, the granny flats or duplexes and, and um, triplexes on, uh, on lots. Where you, yeah, <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's a weird word, right? Um, but come up with, you know, so, so you have a way to get more housing units in the same amount of land uh, and, and bring to, at a lower cost, right? Regulations have so driven up these costs that affordable housing is an oxymoron. And so we need to empower the market to actually fulfill that need. And, and I think we'd be uh, surprised at how quickly that could happen. I want to mention some of those services that are provided either with partnerships or with nonprofit organizations themselves that you might not think about. Uh, and uh, you know, when you're putting together things like this of the scope, you one of the things you learn is how much you don't know. And Lance Azumi and I visited Father Joe's Villages. It's a campus in San Diego. And some of the things, found out some of the things they were doing there. And we've talked to others too. And just a simple thing of, of you know, getting a haircut and a shave. You know, these services can be provided. Writing a resume, getting the resume off to the right people. Clothing, the right kind of clothing, decent clothing. These things, and this is where the private sector is very good at helping people. Now the people want to need to be, you know, want help. Uh, you know, and again, there is you have the blocks with the hurdles of, of substance abuse and mental illness. But these these are small things that you know, that private sector organizations, nonprofits are able to do that the government just simply is not equipped to handle. And it really has no well, idea of how to deal with that. And, and small things mean a lot. I and mean, I you can't underemphasize that. Yeah, I mean, you, you can't. You really don't want to go to a job interview if you've gotten one, if you, you know, if you haven't shaved and showered and had a haircut. And, well, most of us haven't had a haircut in a while now in the last year. But. <laughs> and we're big fans of uh, Deacon Jimmy Vargas, who is the 
uh, CEO of Father Joe's Villages. He's a past speaker at this conference, and um, he does amazing work. He does down there. So, questions from the audience. We got a question from Terry who asks. Can you please address solution suggestions for dealing with mental health issues and homelessness? Uh, when Wayne and I were talking, I believe it was two days ago, right? Wayne talking with Michael Schellenberger. Yes. Uh, it came up and Christopher addresses this in the book of institutionalization. And that's something I probably would have been afraid to touch on by myself, but Chris is being very courageous and brave. Uh, went to it. I, I think the best way to say it is we can't leave that out and uh, as a solution, uh, hospital beds to help people get treated and get back on their feet off of, again, the, the, per, the perilous trifecta, the two problems of, of uh, addiction and mental illness. So, um, you know, I, I, a part of me doesn't want to institutionalize anyone, uh, especially against their will. Now, if they, I'm sorry, is are we still on? You're good. Oh, we're still on. My, my okay. dog is I, very, I'm sorry. Very I heard nervous. something and I. But we it, were waiting. It, it, we were waiting for Wayne's dog to make a cameo appearance. It's okay. <laughs> well, at least it's not one of my dogs. <laughs> uh, I guess the the, the, the shorthand in the, in the end of this comment would be: we can't discount that at this point. Uh, institutionalization, and, and you know, they don't. We don't need to be stigmatized, asylums, that kind of thing. But they, they, done the right way. I just encourage people to buy the book and read what Christopher has to say. And he's, he's written much more on that than I can possibly bring up in a couple of sentences here. What, what, what I would add, and, and I think it's very important, it, these are very difficult issues because it gets to basic uh, liberties and things of that nature. But the, uh, many of the people with mental health issues are actually being institutionalized. They're being institutionalized through the prison system. They're being So, so we're not... By being afraid to act, we're not helping them. We're, in effect, waiting for a reason to prosecute them, to go through the courts, to go through the uh, police, uh, and, and eventually into jails. And so uh, we, we need to actually have a conversation, a hard conversation in terms of if somebody has mental illness and they're, 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 they're homeless, you know, when do we intervene and help them and move them into an uh, uh, institution? Not an asylum that's going to lock them up, but an institution that gets people the help they need so that they can actually transition out of homelessness. And there's, like I said, it, it, it's an uncomfortable conversation, but if we don't, it, 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 we're not having a serious conversation if we're not willing to, to address that and willing to, to ask, when are we willing to move people over? Otherwise, we are already institutionalizing them. It's just, it's through prisons. And so that's, that's not, we know that's not the right way to do it. Wrong institutions. Natalie, right. Natalie drills down on that point a little bit more. And she uh, writes, you know, there have been various efforts by state legislators to change these laws around involuntary psychiatric commitment of individuals that some argue can help remove individuals that are a harm to themselves and others off the street. Um, do do uh, you have any thoughts on this potential, you know, um, solution um, as one way to tackle the problem? Well, I, I think Wayne mentioned Joseph's part of the book uh, and how it's this is a, a excuse me <clears throat> a legislative problem and, and needs to be taken away or not taken away but be need to be out of the courts as much as possible and be yeah, be a a policy problem policy issue policy resolutions uh, and I think that's where this is going to have to be taken care of and I, I you know Joseph says you need specific laws you need laws that are going to not fall apart. When they're challenged, um, and it's it's going to be a tough conversation, just as Wayne said about institutionalization. But it's one that's got to be got to be taken to its to the end. I mean, we need some we need answers, and we, and, need, and, and we need to and, and we need to address this evolving right to homelessness because you 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 went you you went too far from in, instead of criminalizing that you can't remove people from the streets. And so we've, we've gone too far and we're beginning to see this, especially in California, the social decay that comes from that. And so we need to actually, like I said, have that hard conversation, get those laws in place and get them in place where they can withstand the legal challenge. But more than that, 
it moves it from the courts and that evolving constitutional uh, kind of rights to actually kind of public policy, which is where it belongs. Laurel uh, writes in and she says that she's a marriage and family therapist and they have a law in Nevada called Laura's Law. And she believes we have a similar law uh, in um, California and it broadens how you can legally get a person into treatment, which right now is very narrow. Can we get some easy questions, Tim? (laughs) (laughs) I told you you'd be challenged today. Um, Um, Go ahead. Please, Wayne. (laughs) (laughs) Well, well, I'm not aware of everything that I've seen is it's it's getting harder and harder to actually to to do that. So uh, I'm not aware of that. If that is the case, that's fantastic. But I I don't believe in California that's the case because everything we've seen is actually showing the exact opposite that it's getting more and more difficult uh, to to help people in in, in that way. I wonder if she's referring to the 5150 law. Maybe Maybe you should call Joseph and, you know, say, <laughs> we wish you would have had, we had you available, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't feel equipped to, to speak to that as, as, uh, as, uh, as much as I wish I could be. Uh, Laurel says it is not 5150. Is that the 5150? Why she says <laughs> she's a therapist dealing with this every day. And she thinks you're, you're, you're spot on with where you're going. So thumbs up from Laurel to, uh, <laughs> to you both. Um, uh, Wayne, maybe a question for you. We mentioned it a little earlier. You know, Governor Newsom's recent effort to combat homelessness has been this Project Room Key, which involved the state buying hotels and motels and vacant apartment buildings. A lot of them are vacant, sadly, because of COVID-19, to convert them into housing uh, for the homeless. What are your thoughts on this program? Do you think this is a, an approach that could be a successful? It's not, if not, what should he be doing differently? I, I don't think it's going to be a success because he's not, he, it's not embracing kind of that holistic approach that we were talking about earlier. It's not actually trying to deal with kind of why people are in that situation and trying to, to move them off of it. It's really, it, it, it's a variant of the housing first and it's A, very expensive, He's funded it with the COVID money. So next year, there's going to be a big hole if we're going to continue it. And that doesn't take into account, uh, you know, if, if there's any um, other costs, damages, things of that nature that could come from it. But again, it's just, there, there needs to be a balance because, you know, this is one of the things that when we we're talking about San Francisco, we, a couple of years ago, Carrie and I were feeling a lot of pressure because we wanted to address the problem immediately. You know, how do you get people off the street today? Right. You know, my, my, my thing about raising uh, deregulation to increase uh, affordability, that takes time. There's people on the street today. How do we get them off? And so to some extent, you know, you need to move people to shelters and the home key program is kind of part of that concept. But if you're not integrating that with programs like uh, Father Deacon, if you're not in with sh- uh, shutters, uh, shelters to shutters, then all you're really doing is a version of kind of housing first. And it's just it's destined to fail. It's destined to just bring those problems kind of to the place you're putting it. And there's, there's a lot of adverse consequences from that. So I, I, I think the idea of getting people off the streets, that's, that's spot on. But if, if you're not doing it with the right support services, you're not thinking about the right way, and you're doing it with a temporary money that's going to be very expensive, I, I feel you're setting yourself up for failure. I think we have a policymaker who says, I have to do something. The public's expecting me to do something. Let's do this. And this is what we've done all the time. It's the kind of thing that, 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 you know, these are the public responses we've had for decades. And But the record there, the public policies, well, I'll just say government responses, I think is a better way to put it. They've, they've solved nothing. And I, it's, it's so easily argued that they've made things worse. So I guess the last question, it may be a little bit more of a philosophical one. We only have a couple of minutes left here. You know, we, as we've, you know, discuss today, there are unquestionably roles for government agencies, law enforcement, nonprofits, and private and religious charities in addressing homelessness. But it seems like everyone kind of marches to the beat of their own drummer without a lot of coordination. And so maybe we could close with uh, some thoughts on ways that the public and private sector 
are successfully collaborating to get people off the streets and how can we encourage more collaboration? Chair, I'll let you start with that one. <laughs> well, some of the things we have mentioned uh, and uh, equipping one for police officers for dealing with, you know, since they're, they're often the first, first responder in the situation because they're out there in the streets and let them know where, you know, train them, give them some information, let them know where they can connect this person with where there's some help. Um, I, I, maybe the, well, this is tough to say, but at the same time, it, it's not, uh, maybe the best thing we ever can do is just get out of the way. Because again, I go back to its record. It's a poor record. And if it's going to pour resources somewhere, uh, send it to the organizations that have records of putting people back together, getting them off the streets, putting them back into productive lives. Uh, you know, uh, and visiting these places and talking to these people, these, these, they're dedicated, they're smart, they're innovative. They want to see people change. They want to see lives change. It's a very different mindset than you're going to find in a bureaucrat. And I, I, if you're going to spend resources, spend them in the right places, in the right way. Yeah, I, I, I would just concur with that, that the government role is certainly first responders, but to, to have the knowledge to where people can be kind of connected to those private organizations that work. Because inevitably, when you look across the country, you've seen these private organizations are much better at sustainably helping people, getting them uh, out of a, if, they're, if it's a drug cycle, if it's an economic hardship, whatever it is, they're focusing on the causal reasons are on the streets, addressing them and helping them sustainably kind of get back on their feet and, and, and you know, have a job and a home and, you know, all of the good things that follow. Inevitably, those are the private organizations that excel at it. So what the, the, the government needs to do is focus on what it does well and having the knowledge and connecting to those organizations that can help. And I think we'll, we'll be much more successful that way. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. And when you're on these platforms, don't forget to give us a big five stars. If you don't subscribe to any of these, you can still listen on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash Pacific Research One. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Ichon. Hope you'll come back again for next round with PRI.